All right, so in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, uh, the part of the scripture that I really want to focus in there is in kind of that, that beginning half. It begins in verse 1. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house made not with, made not with hands, eternal of heavens. Jump down to verse 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are yet at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Go to verse 8. He says, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And the title of the sermon this morning is Willing to be Absent. Willing to be Absent. And that title will make more sense near the end of the sermon. But what I want to start out in the sermon here this morning is pointing out the fact that, that Paul here is expressing a great deal of confidence over about what is to come. You know, and that's a confidence that we all have. You know, if we're saved, we know that we're on our way to heaven, that nothing can change that. That no matter what happens in this life, Jesus Christ has shed his blood for us, that he has died for us, that he was buried, that he rose again, that we have put our faith in him, and that we've received the free gift of salvation, and nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. That's the confidence that we have. And that's the confidence here that Paul is expressing. He says, we know that if our er earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. He's talking about the terrestrial body dissolving away and receiving that celestial body, that, that home for our spirit in heaven that is not made with heads, that is eternal in the heavens. It's not going to fade away. And he says that we are always confident knowing this. And he says in verse 8 again that we are confident that if we were to be absent from this body, that if we were to die, that we would be immediately present with the body, or excuse me, we would be immediately present with the Lord in that new body. <laughs> and you see what this confidence does for Paul. If you would... Keep something there all morning in 2 Corinthians 5. We'll come back later uh, a couple times this morning. But go back one chapter to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And you'll see what this confidence did with Paul. See, this confidence ought to move us to do something. This confidence that we have, that we're saved, that we're on our way to heaven, you know, that should inspire us to serve God. That should make us bold to serve the Lord. And that's what it did for Paul. If you look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 7. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Look at verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which are, uh, live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then that death work in us, in us, but life in you. He's saying, look, we're confident here. He, he has this confidence expressed there in 2 Corinthians 5 that allows him to go and face these persecutions. That's why he's able to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he's persecuted, but he's not, he, he's not forsaken, that he's cast down, but he's not destroyed, that he's always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Look there in verse 13, he said, We having the same spirit of faith as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall, up, uh, shall raise up also us, excuse me, shall raise up all, us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So Paul is very confident here and he was so confident that he was willing to die. He was so sure of the fact that he had a, a tabernacle in heaven, a new body waiting for him, that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord, that he was willing to die. He was willing to suffer all these things. He said in verse 11, we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our flesh. And he said he's always delivered. I mean, persecution for Paul wasn't a maybe. It wasn't some far off thing that might happen one day. It was his life. I mean, he lived a life of persecution. We can go read the, the latter half of Acts where, where Paul suffered, great, uh, you know, suffered greatly for the Lord, being beaten, being stoned to death, being whipped, being imprisoned. I mean, shipwrecked and, and, you know, at, at the sea for a night and a day. I mean, he went through so many things, suffering for Christ. Why was he able to go through that? Because of the confidence that he had that if he were to die, he would be immediately present with the Lord. He was always delivered unto, unto death. You know, Paul, he, he consistently knocked on death's door, didn't he? He was right there serving the Lord, just constantly knocking on death's door. They said, speak no more in his name. They'd beat him. They'd stone him. He'd pick himself up, dust himself off, and go to the next town. I mean, he lived 
a life of persecution. And all he had to do, if you think about it, Paul could have spared all, himself all of that. He didn't have to go through that. He could have just made it all end. What did he, all he would have to do is just shut up. All he had to do was just say, you know what, you're right. I won't speak anymore in his name. And just not said another word. And he could have had a nice, peaceful life with man. I'm sure God would have been pleased with him and probably would have made it even worse for him. But humanly speaking, he could have just, you know, clammed up and gone about his life. That's not what he did. He said there in verse 13, We having the same spirit of faith, as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now, it's, that's an interesting quote, and that's actually a quote from Psalms 116, if you turn over there. Psalms 116. He's saying, we having the same spirit of faith. The same spirit of faith as who? As the person who wrote Psalm 116, the person he's about to quote, as it is written. I believed and therefore have I spoken, and we also believe and therefore speak. He said, we're the same, we had the same spirit of faith as the guy that said, I believed and therefore I have spoken. You're going to Psalm 116. You know, Paul, in regards to this life that he lived of, of always being persecuted, being willing to die for the Lord's sake, you say, why was he so able to do that? Well, part of it was his confidence. You know, I mean, the ma major part of it was the confidence that he had that he was going to be with the Lord. And he knew that the best that, the, they, that they could threaten him with was the, or, you know, the worst they could threaten him with, rather. Let me, uh, let me uh, say that again. The worst that they could threaten him with was the best that heaven had to offer. I mean, think about it. You know, by the Bible says that we should not fear them which can destroy the body, but fear them which just can destroy the body and soul in hell. I mean, the, best, the worst they can do is send you to heaven, folks. It reminds me of that story of, uh, you know, Brother Bill Rice, an old-time preacher. You know, the, the, I don't know if this is just Baptist lore. You know, this is certainly within the realm of possibility. I'm sure it happened. But the, the story I heard, the way it goes, is he had got, been at some meeting somewhere, and he was preaching something, and he was sitting down, after the service and some guy who was disgruntled, didn't like the things he had to say, came up to him and pulled the gun on him and said, I'm going to kill you for the things you say or something to that effect. And the story goes that Brother Rice just looked him right back in the eye and said, can you threaten me with heaven? <laughs> and that was the worst you got? You're going to shoot me and send me to glory? Right. Ah! You know, but that's, that's the, the spirit that Paul had. That's the attitude that Paul had. That's the attitude we should all have is this confidence that if, the worst they can do to us is send us to heaven. <clears throat> and Paul, quite frankly, and getting ahead of myself a little bit, I mean, he almost seems like the type that was welcoming it. Like he was like, you know what, I, I almost prefer to die and go to glory. We'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. But he's saying here in 2 Corinthians 4 that he has the same spirit of faith as it is written, I believed and therefore also have I spoken. And if you look there in Psalm 116, look at verse 7. The, the psalmist writes, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee, for I was delivered. Uh, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. So this sounds like a man who was going through some persecution. He was delivered from death. God delivered him. Mine eyes from tears. You know, he was going through some persecution. There was some grief in his life. There was some, uh, you know, he was, he was being persecuted. Mine, uh, mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. People were trying to trip him up. People were trying to cause him to stumble. And he goes on and says in verse 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. So the faith of the psalmist here is the same faith of Paul that he, they will serve the Lord in the face of adversity. And that's the faith that we need to have. I believe, therefore I will speak, even unto death, <clears throat> and trust that the Lord will deliver us, but if we perish, we perish. He goes on in verse 10 there, if you look, he says, I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. They couldn't shut him up. He was going to go ahead and say what he had to say. I said in my haste, all men are liars. Now, when he says, I said that in my haste, I don't think he's saying, I was, you know, I was hasty. I shouldn't have said that. No, he was quick to say, all men are liars. That's what he's saying, because that's a true statement. Let God be true and every man a liar. That's scripture. He said, I, you know, I was greatly afflicted, but you know what? All men are liars. And he didn't hold back. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And of course, that last part there is a very famous verse. 
But it's inferred here in this passage that what makes the, 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 the death of a saint so precious isn't just the fact that they died. I mean, we can all do that, right? In fact, we're all going to do that one day. But what makes it so precious is that he was willing to die, it, 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 that they would will, be willing to die in service to the Lord. That even when persecution came, they were going to continue to serve God even if it cost them their neck. That's what makes it so precious. I mean, that's what he's saying here. I was greatly afflicted. I was greatly afflicted. But you know what? I will take the cup of the salvation. I will pay my vows. They're not going to stop me from serving God, even though they afflict me, have afflicted me. You know, I believe, therefore I will speak. You're not going to shut me up. That's what he's saying here. <clears throat> and this confidence that he has, like Paul, the psalmist and Paul, this confidence comes from faith. You know, it's something that we receive because of the fact that we have believed. I believed. Therefore, I have spoken. You know, our faith should give us confidence. Our faith should not cause us to become timid or want to draw back or hide our light under a bushel. We should be bold with our faith and telling others about it. I believe, therefore, I have spoken. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said in verse 6, Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Again, that confidence comes through faith. The fact that, you know, we don't, we don't see heaven and we haven't been there, but we know we're going. And therefore, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. And that walk is not us tiptoeing through life, you know, being a secret service Christian, being an under the radar Christian. That's, it's a bold walk that, pro, that proclaims our faith, that goes out and lets the world know that we have believed and therefore we speak. That confidence comes through faith, but that confidence you know, is there to make us bold and that confidence also comes through the Spirit. You know, this isn't, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time convincing anybody in this room this morning that's saying that they're on their way to heaven because you have the Spirit in you and when I, we just read these words in the Bible, they speak to you and you know this is the truth. That's the witness of the Spirit. That confidence comes through the Spirit. He says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse, uh, verse 5 there, Now he that wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, who hath also given on us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident. What makes us confident? The fact that we have the earnest of the Spirit. We have the down payment of the Spirit. We're sealed. We've been purchased by God. We know that we're on our way to heaven. That should make us confident. Not bashful, not shy. The Bible says, go over to Romans chapter 8. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not. You know, what is the confidence that we have as Christians? Is that if someone dies in the Lord, they've gone to be with God in heaven. And that should be a, a source of, you know, great comfort to the Christian, that we don't mourn as others. <clears throat> he says uh, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know, some people pass on in this life and it's a grief to people because we don't know where they went. But when a person dies, even tragically, even suddenly, even unexpectedly, you know, I'm not saying it's gonna that that it's just you know a, a you know a, a, a you know a walk through the roses. It's still difficult. There, there's a lot of difficulties and grief and mourning. We understand, but you know what? The edge is taken off. The blunt isn't there. The the blunt trauma isn't there from the fact that if we that person died and we didn't know if they were saved or not, you know, what's the hope there? But when that person dies, you know, we have this hope that they've gone to be with, with the Lord. Why? Because they have the earnest of the Spirit. That's what gives us that confidence, the Spirit. <clears throat> it says in Romans chapter 8, look at verse 16. It says, The Spirit bear itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's why I don't need to spend a lot of time here convincing you that you're God's child. You know, if you believed, if you put your faith in Christ, you're born again, you just read that and you know it's true. And that you have the witness within you. And that's what's going to keep you, uh, you know, living for the Lord if you dwell in that. And don't let your, your faith be shaken from that. And he said, uh, we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. We're going to go to heaven. Or we're going to have an inheritance. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You know, that inheritance is going to be made better by your suffering. And that's why Paul embraced it. That's why Paul didn't, sh didn't shy away from it. That's why Paul wasn't going to shut up. 
That's why Paul, having believed, was going to continue to speak. That by any means he might attain a better resurrection. Not attain the resurrection, but a better one. Look, the resurrection's coming, folks. If you're saved, you're, get, you're going. But some folks' resurrection is going to be better than others because of the reward that they will receive. And that's what 2 Corinthians uh, 5 goes on and teaches us. If you would go back there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, we have this confidence through the Spirit. And it's there to make us bold. We have this confidence by faith, and I believe everybody has that. It's not, it's not a difficult thing to have. I don't think there's anybody in the room that would say, well, I'm not willing to die for the Lord. And of course, we never really know until we're put in that position. And it's easy to talk and say that, right? But, I mean, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Likely, everyone would be willing to go through with that if they had to, if push came to shove. We hope so. <clears throat> but you know what? Having that confidence is not enough to guarantee you that you will. That confidence is not enough to, to, to guarantee that we would endure what Paul endured. He says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 6. <clears throat> Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather. See, what, with Paul, it wasn't just he was confident. He was willing. He wasn't just sure that he was saved. He wasn't just sure that he was on his way to his heaven. He, wasn't, he, wasn't, he was willing to go there. And he was willing to say, yeah, go ahead, destroy this body. I mean, he was like the Lord, the same faith that the Lord had. Destroy this temple in the three days, I will raise it up. He, that's the confidence that he had, but he also had the willingness to go with it. Willing rather what? To be absent from the body and to be present from the Lord. <clears throat> you see, Paul's confidence is what moved him to lay down his life if needed. It was his confidence, but he, that confidence gave him the willingness to be, to, to be able to do that. If you go over to Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 23. This is a pretty famous passage. We see how willing Paul was. I mean, when I read it, I start to scratch my head and wonder, maybe Paul, you know, was more than willing. He, it was actually his preference. In fact, that's what Philippians 1 tells us. He would rather have died and gone home to be with the Lord. That was his preference. That's how willing he was to be absent from this body. He said in verse uh, 23 of Philippians 1, 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two. You know, he's, what is he talking about being a strait? He's caught, you know, like between a rock and a hard place. He's, he's being pulled in two directions. He's stuck. Having a desire to depart. That was his desire. Saying, look, I'm willing to be absent from the body. I'm not only confident, I'm willing rather to be absent from the body. <coughs> He says, uh, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. And that's a true statement. You know, and that's not a knock on the Philippians or anybody else to, to prefer the Lord's company over anybody else on earth. That's just a fact of the matter. We should all be able to say that. That you know what? Going to be with God is better than anything you can get down here. There's no fellowship sweeter. There's no, uh, there's no place you'd rather be than in heaven. <coughs> and Paul is so willing here that it was his preference to living. He's saying, I would rather depart and go. And the only thing that kept him here is the work that needed to be done. That's the only thing that kept him here. That's the only reason that, stuck, that God kept him around. Look at verse 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence that I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by coming, my coming to you again. He's saying, look, the only reason I'm sticking around here is not for me, because I'd rather go. I'm willing to be absent. That's my preference. But he's saying, I'm going to stick around for your sake, because that's what's needful for the Philippian people. That's, what, that's what's needful. Hey, that, folks, no matter how willing we get to go, that is why we're here. You know, we might be just ready to just Lord, take me. I'm ready. Let's, let's just end it all, you know. Let's go. I'm not advocating anything, you know, weird. We're not going to roll out some Kool-Aid or anything this morning. <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying, hey, if, that, if you get to that place like Paul did, where you're just, I'd rather go be with the Lord, understand this. You still have a job to do. We still have work. That It's others. That's why we're still here. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> 
He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6 again, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know, and that's, and that's the interesting, this isn't Paul despairing of life. You know, as he started in the beginning there in First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, you know, you've he, he, he got to take note of this. This isn't this macabre death wish that he has. You know, this wasn't because Paul is just so down in the dumps that he's ready to just off himself. He's saying, he's saying here that we would, uh, for, in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 5, For this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, He's saying, look, it's not because I just want to get out of this, this you know, sack of skin and go to heaven. He's saying, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. His desire for, was for what was to come. That's what he, why he wanted to go to heaven. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, you know, we're, we're willing to be absent and to be present with the Lord. It wasn't just, I want to get out of this situation. It was, I just would rather be with God. But he says in verse 9, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him he's saying that's the reason why we labor is that we can be accepted of him whether we're there with him or not you know what that tells me is it's possible to not be accepted of the lord i'm not saying unsaved we know we understand that i'm just saying that not everyone's going to hear those words well done thou good and profitable servant enter thou into the joy of the lord some people just give me like well i made it thanks lord and he's say you're welcome i'm glad you're here you know, and you can, you can go over there and, and sweep the floor or something. You know, you're not going to rule over ten cities. You're not going to rule over five cities. Right. Some people are going to, you know, shine brighter than others. They're going to be given more responsibilities. Right. So he's saying, look, we labor. I'm sticking around here and I'm doing the work. That whether I'm there or here, I'm going to be accepted of the Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to what we've done, whether it be good or bad. Again, this isn't talking about sin. This is talking about whether your works are going to be wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stone. That's the difference there. And we're all going to have a mix of both, and I don't want to go into all of that this morning. But you see, the confident person like Paul, who's confident in the fact that when he's going to go, to, that he's going to heaven when he dies, that he desires to be with the Lord, that that is his desire, that is his confidence, that person is the one who puts in the work. That's how you can tell the person who really believes that they're on their way there and, and it's, this is very real to them. That they understand that they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day and they're going to have their works you know, uh, you know, doled out to them. They're going to receive reward or they're not. They're going to suffer loss or they're going to receive reward. They understand that. That's their focus. That's the person that puts in the work, like Paul, who is willing to labor that they would be accepted. <clears throat> And why is it that some people do more than others? Why does it seem like some people are more on fire for the Lord than other people? Why is it some people are, are more faithful to serving God than other people? And I, I, have, I scratch my head and I think, well, maybe it's because some people are just more willing to be absent. Some people, it's like they're already there. Some people are just more willing to be absent. And by that, I mean willing to be absent in the sense of not so caught up in the things of this life not so invested in the things of this life that it's as if they're, they're willing to go. There's nothing holding them back other than the work of God. <clears throat> you see, when we're willing to be absent from the body, that really puts life in perspective. When we get to the place where we say, look, I'm willing to go and die for the Lord, and if that's, if that's His will, I'm willing to do that. That puts the rest of life in perspective. How are we going to spend our time then if that's our, if that's our attitude? What are we going to invest in if that's our attitude, that I'm willing to be absent from this life, that I'm not going to let things you know, get me caught up? Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> See, the confident person, he's the one who's going to put in the work. The one who knows that I'm on my way to heaven, that there's a reward waiting for me, so I might as well get busy serving God because that's the only thing that's going to matter in all of eternity. All the things that I do down here, all the fun I have, all the work I do, all of that, you know, is wood, hay, and stubble. And there's nothing inherently wrong with those things. They're not even sinful. And there's a time and place for them.
But when we make our life all about just the pleasures and the cares of this life, friend, we're missing out on the bigger picture. And we have to step back and ask ourselves, are we really willing to be absent from the body? Or will we get to heaven and say, you know, Lord, I would have liked to stuck around because there's, you know, there's a few more weekends on the lake I, I would have enjoyed. Or was it like Paul? Lord, I, I, I would have stuck around if you wanted me to, to do the work. <clears throat> he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or withal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what things ye have need of. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of the self. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What's he saying? There's enough to worry about today to sit there and get, don't get so caught up in tomorrow. Go over to Matthew chapter 13. That's the perspective we have to have. That we're not going to get, that, that we're going to seek first the kingdom of God. I know this is a familiar passage. I know we heard that quote, quoted all the time. We might even know it by heart. But is that the way we're living our life? Are we really seeking the things of God first? Are we putting them first in our life? Are we seeking first the kingdom of God or are, we, or are we more worried about what we're going to eat? Now, I know we're Baptists and it's a struggle, but are we more worried about what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink or what we're going to be clothed? Are we worrying about these things more than what God would have us to do today? Are we more worried about that than the, the evil of today, the worries and the cares that are, that are going to be sufficient for today? Look, there's enough to worry about today that it doesn't do any good to sit there and fret about tomorrow. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Of course, this is the parable of the sower, very famous. And he talks about the fact that he goes out and he sows seed on different types of ground. And we all know the story here that, that, ground, that the seed takes root and it, it brings forth different results in different types of ground, right? And he says in verse 21, Yet he hath not root himself, but doeth for a while. For in tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by, and he is offended. So the one type of ground, right, is the rocky ground. He receives that seed on rocky soil. It takes root. It's there. You know, it's, not the, it's not the wayside where it doesn't even have a chance to get in there and germinate. It gets down in the soil and it's there, but you know what? It's too rocky and it doesn't have any root. And by and by, you know, he's offended when the persecution comes. You can't say that of Paul. Paul's certainly not, that, not type, that type of ground. He welcomed the persecution. I mean, he knocked on death's door and he lived on persecution's porch, folks. That's where he was. That was his life. <clears throat> he was not offended. He embraced it. And he goes on and says in verse 22, and he says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received the seed into good ground is he that uh, heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Look, they all heard the word. They all received it. But the last guy, what did he do? He understood it. He embraced it. It was his. He was like, Paul, look, I'm confident of this. I'm so confident the fact that when, I'm, when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. I know what's coming. I'm so confident of this that I'm even willing to be absent. And he's the one that got to work. And he's the one that was bearing fruit. He's not the one that got caught up, you know, worried about the persecution that might come. Got caught up worrying about all the cares of this life. <clears throat> Notice the things that prevent people from bearing fruit in their life. You know, we, we would say the persecution. That's, that's a big one, right? And look, a lot of us can make it through that. A lot of us will stand by the man of God. We'll stand for the word of God. We'll proclaim our faith. We'll, we'll let the chips fall where they may. We'll be there. And we'll be faithful. And we'll make it through there. But, you know, that's not the only thing that stops people from serving God. A lot of times, even the people that are willing to go through that, the things that get them are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. That's a big one. That's what the, the second ground was there. He said, the deceitful niches of riches choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You know what's interesting about that soil? Is there's nothing wrong with the soil. They both brought forth life, didn't they? It was, good, it was a seed that received into good soil. Good soil doesn't yield uh, anything. You know, if it's got about a bunch of rocks and everything, nothing's going to grow there, good or bad. The problem with this guy was not the soil. It's not the things, uh, th it wasn't the fact that things couldn't grow there. It's the fact that they let the wrong things grow. <coughs> he allowed all these things, other things to grow in it. He allowed the, the, the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world to choke the word in his life and he became unfruitful. 
So the point is this, and really this is the thrust of the message this morning, is that if we are unwilling to separate from this life while we live, we're not going to accomplish all that we can for Christ. You know, if we're not willing to be absent now, even though that, you know, we might live a long natural life, die in a, in a ripe old age, in good health, if you're not willing to be absent from the body now, in spite of that fact, you're not going to accomplish everything you could for Christ. We could do so much more for God if we would just be willing to be absent from the body. Be willing to be absent from everything that's trying to pull us away from serving God. You know, I'm going to be absent from whatever else is going on that's going to take, uh, you know, it's going to take the time uh, that I have for the Lord away. The things that want to you know, lure us away from serving God, those are the things we need to be absent from in this life. Go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my, uh, my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace. What was Paul's joy in his life? What was going to bring Paul joy? Was it going to, you know, go him hanging out at the bar or, you know, having all of his hobbies and everything else? No, that's not what his joy was. He said I might, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received the Lord to testify the gospel of grace of God. The joy that he was going to have was going to come from the fact that he lived his, he ran, uh, he ran the race and he finished his course, that he kept the faith, that he didn't let the cares of this world creep in and choke out the word in his life, that he, you know, and that he didn't allow persecution to, you know, uh, to, to sway him. He said, you know, these things, none of these things move me and I don't count my life dear. I think sometimes the problem we have as Christians is that we think our time, we think our time is our time. Look, it's not your time. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying we have to give every waking moment, you know, to just knocking doors and reading our Bible. I, I understand God wants us to enjoy things in life, that this is the good of man to enjoy the fruit of his labor. There is that. But when that becomes all of our life, something's wrong. <clears throat> and he's saying, look, the, 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 he doesn't count his life dear unto himself because he understood something. It's not his time. It's not his life. And we've talked about this you know, recently. You, you're not your own. You're bought with the price as the precious blood of a lamb without spot or wrinkle. You know, we've been, we've been, God has redeemed us unto himself. Ye are not your own, the Bible says. <clears throat> So here's the question this morning. Are we willing to be absent while we're present? If that makes sense. Are we willing to be absent from the cares of this life? All the things that are vying for our attention. All the things that want to rob us of our reward in heaven. Are we willing to be absent from those things? While we're here in this life to do the work of God. The answer is, is in the works. You know, we can tell one another that. We can say we are. But the works will do all the speaking for us. <clears throat> you know, the works that we do or the works that we leave undone are going to answer that question of whether or not we were willing to be absent. Let's go ahead and pray.